Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church on this bright and sunny Easter, Easter day. <clears throat> I invite you to look at the announcements in the back of your bulletin and any that might have occurred in your weekly newsletter this week that you get at home. We would appreciate you signing the friendship register and passing it down the row so that all have a chance to register their attendance. And if you have an email address or haven't given one to the office recently, please do, do so as you sign the register today. I would draw your attention to uh, April 26th, Sunday, April 26th. We will celebrate our youth on that day and they will be leading our service. We will celebrate with those students graduating this year on May 3rd with a special presentation during the worship and a reception afterwards. And we will again be stocking shells at Loaves and Fishes during the month of May. So we'll be having sign-up sheets, I'm sure, and uh, to sign up this month for the uh, stocking of the shells at Loaves and Fishes in the month of May. Also, during the opening hymn today, uh, those who want to put flowers on the cross, uh, you may do so during that opening hymn. The flowers are located right here by the cross. <clears throat> All of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Good morning. We come into these baptismal waters this morning, joining three of our young people who are this day saying, faith is mine. My parents have raised me in the church, but today I claim faith for myself. I come this day to let God know I love you. These people, these young people come into this baptistry to be reminded that they are loved by God. So they make an important step in their faith journey, a journey that many of you have been involved with for years. And we are grateful to see such witness. When they step into these waters, we are reminded of our own baptisms, or maybe we are looking forward to a baptism to be held in the future. Either way, we are reminded of the risen Christ. We are reminded that these young people will rise as new people this day, and so we celebrate. This is Griffin Taylor. He's been in this church since he was in diapers. <laughs> his family's been here for generations, and this day he claims his faith as his own. Griffin, based on the confession that you believe in God is revealed through Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the one who creates us, the name of the one who redeems us, and in the name of the one who sustains us. Rise and walk in newness of life. This is Emily Bennett, a sixth grader. She has been here with her parents and her grandmother since she was a child. We are excited to celebrate this day her faith. Emily, based upon your confession of faith in God is revealed through Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the one who creates us, in the name of the one who redeems us, and in the name of the one who sustains us. Rise and walk in newness of life. senior member of the pastor's class, Brianna Kangro. Her parents came to school here at WIU and came back. And when they came back, they brought two beautiful daughters, 
not long ago, her sister was in these baptismal waters, and now Brianna comes and makes her own confession, her own witness to her faith. Brianna, based on your confession of faith, that you believe in God as revealed in Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the one who creates us, the one who redeems us, and the one who sustains us. Rise and walk in newness of life. Will you pray with me, please? God of life and new life, God of all times, God of death and resurrection, we give thanks for these three beautiful young people these, your children, who walk in the footsteps of your son as they come into these baptismal waters, pour your spirit upon them. Help them to feel your hand on their lives, not just today, but for many days to come. In the difficult moments of their lives, may they turn to their faith. May they be a great witness for you always. And on this special day, God, just as Jesus stood in these waters and heard your voice, Speak to them. Help them to hear that this is your child. These are your children, your daughters, your son. And you are so pleased and so happy for the faith that they are taking on for themselves and showing to the world. Good and gracious God, be faithful to these your faithful. Be worthy of the trust that they are putting to you. Continue to pour your life and love into them, and may they show your life and love to everyone from this point forward. We pray this prayer in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. If you are able, would you please stand and join me in the call to worship. He is risen. He is risen indeed. 
God became flesh and walked among us. Jesus lives still among us, and through him we breathe the breath of God. Our opening hymn this morning is Christ the Lord is Risen Today, number 2, 216. Would you join me in the invocation, please? Risen God, we shout with angels and archangels, hallelujah. He is risen. Death is defeated, and the life we now live is the life of God. No longer must we live in fear under the burden of sin. Jesus has set us free. We lift our faces and open our hearts in collective celebration of the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Jesus lives. Amen. Would the children please come forward?
with me. Yay. Now, ha. Uh, how are you doing, Drew? Good. What did you think of those baptisms? Good. Were they fun? Was it fun to watch your brother there? Kind of. You know, they're supposed to be out here. They just don't change as fast as I do. <laughs> Isn't that fun? What do you think the baptism um, was about? Was it about faith? Yeah, maybe. Maybe about faith. Faith in Jesus, yeah. What is today? Easter, Easter that's right. And did you get an Easter basket? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> he looks at his parents. Oh, look who's coming. And have you seen any Easter eggs today? Yeah. Yeah. And have we played lots of games and had party here at church? Yeah. And um, do you think that Easter is about those eggs and candy and games? It is in part, isn't it? Because we do that at church. Why do you think we have an Easter party? Just because we want to have a party? To celebrate. What do we celebrate on Easter? Jesus' resurrection. We celebrate an empty tomb. Um, you know why we have eggs at Easter? You know, it's not the Easter Bunny thing, right? I mean, we feel like the Easter Bunny takes over Easter, but the Easter Bunny is just one part of the celebration of Easter. You know why? You know why we have eggs? What comes out of eggs? Candy. Candy. <laughs> Baby Baby chickens, baby chicks, baby birds come out of eggs, right? Soon we're going to see, you can already start to see the grass getting green, right? You can start to see plants sprouting up, right? That is all new life, right? That's all new life. And when Jesus comes out of the tomb, we are reminded of new life, new life. Sometimes we think about that new life here on earth, and sometimes we think of that new life beyond but it's all about new life. That's Easter, okay? So as our baptismal candidates have risen out of the baptismal waters into some type of new life to be lived for Jesus and to be lived for God, we are thankful for this day of Easter when we can celebrate, all of us, no matter whether we've gone into the baptismal waters or not, we can celebrate this new life. So I hope and pray that's what you do today. Does there seem to be someone who's too old to be sitting here? <laughs> Does anybody know who this is? No. Well, I want to introduce him to you. So everybody take a look at him. Why don't you tell us your name? Um, Thaddeus Silver. Thaddeus. Thaddeus. Tad um, is going to do something new at our church. He's been hired to be the children's minister of First Christian Church. Yeah. Am I your minister? Yeah. But now you have someone who's also your minister, whose primary focus is to think about you and your family and your growing up in this church. Is that cool? We are hopeful for his ministry here, aren't we? For adding to your Sunday school experience, taking over your JYF experiences, and working with our volunteers who have already been doing such a great job, right? Janelle and Jack have done a great job, and so many others. But Tad now gets to help out. And um, so we're excited for his ministry to be with you guys. And uh, so thanks, Tad, for saying yes. Thanks for applying. And welcome on behalf of First Christian Church. Welcome to your new job. <laughs> Can we pray together, please? God, we give thanks for this day of celebration, for new life, for new jobs. May we celebrate well this day the faith that you have for us, and may we experience this new life of the empty tomb for days and days and months and even years to come. In the name of the Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much for coming up.
Good morning again. It is a wonderfully, beautifully busy day. Don't you love wonderfully, beautifully busy days as opposed to chaotic, chaotic, meaning chaotic and crazy all in the same moment? (laughs) I need to find the words or the sermon is going to be very interesting today. We come to this time of prayer, remembering that there are many in our church family that need our prayers, remembering that we never express all the names when we come into this place. We are thankful to see Jean Cooper, who is here with us today, who spent some time in St. Louis last week and is maybe headed back there for another two-week stay. We're prayerful for your cancer treatments and hopeful for your situation. Happy Easter, my friend. Good to see you. Let us breathe for just a moment. Let us center our faith on the cross, on the baptismal waters, on the Christ. Let us come into this place remembering that we are never alone. Let us begin our morning prayer in silence. God of Alleluia's, God of new life, God of empty tombs. We come into the sanctuary today on this beautiful Easter morning, expecting so much, hoping for so much, remembering the goodness of life and new life that you offer to us. We come into this place with new hearts today, God. The resurrection is made known in the midst of our celebration. We realize that there are so many in need, so many in pain, so many who are lonely, so many who feel lost. If we're truthful, some of us feel like that. But we come here today to try to be filled up. Pour your love into this place as you always do. May we feel your presence. May we know your peace in the midst of our crazy and chaotic lives. Touch us with your faith that somehow today we can be changed. Whether we walk into baptismal waters or just watch, touch us today that we can be changed, that we can find something in our heart that is new. We've been along a journey this Lent. We've been trying to cross over from this faith to that faith, from no faith to some faith to strong faith to stronger faith. We've been seeking God to find ways to live like your son, to understand him better, to truly be his disciples. So this day we come so excited, not because we can drink soda again or that we can eat sweets or chocolate, but because we can be your people, that we can be faithful to you as you have been faithful to us. So in the midst of our loneliness and our lostness, in the midst of the strength of our faith, in the midst of our exciting day, our party with you. Give us the strength and the courage to be your people, to go beyond our Lenten journey, to walk right past Easter into a life journey with you. 
we pray this day that that can happen. For with you, we are stronger. For with you, even in our most difficult moments, we can cope. For with you, we can be loved and we can share love in ways we never, ever imagined. This is our Easter prayer. Spoken in the name of the risen Christ, who taught his disciples and even us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Even from behind the scenes, the choir sounds really, really good, especially when I'm out here with you. Thank you so much for your music on this Easter. <coughs> Our scripture comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. It's printed in the bulletin if you'd like to read along. If you'd like to just listen, that is fine. Let us hear the word. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. 
they had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. May God add blessing and understanding to the hearing of this word this day. We have been on a Lenten journey this Easter. We've called our journey crossings, not really Easter. It was a Lenten journey. We've just gotten to Easter. But we've been talking all season long about moving from one place to the next, about not staying static, about thinking of Lent in a way that isn't just prayerful and consideration. Each of our sermons through the course of Lent have been one action verb, one word action verb titles to reinforce that theme, that we're moving forward through this time of Lent, that we're coming from this place and we're going to move to this place or this place or even this place. It just depends on what your walk has been able to do, how far you've been able to go in your journey. But the journey, the Lenten journey is over, my friends. Easter has come and we stand up and we sing, Hallelujah! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Do you mean it? Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Happy Easter. That's probably enough of a sermon right there. But I have some other things prepared, so we're going to go on. <laughs> Billy Graham once in his ministry when he was young came to a certain town and, and, and he wanted to mail a letter to someone. It was a town he didn't know very well, and so he asked a young boy walking by, it was like, hey, can you point me to the, to the post office, please? And, and the young man gave him the directions, and he said to the, little, to the boy, he said, you know what, tonight, if you come to the church down the street, I'm going to be preaching, and I can teach you how to get to heaven. And the little boy looked at him and said, sir, you don't even know how to get to the post office. <laughs> The great Billy Graham, kind of put in his place by a, a young boy. Sometimes we just have to rise up and get over ourselves, don't we? Sometimes we just have to rise up and get over ourselves. There's a tale, a folk tale, about a time when God was walking upon the earth, and this is in days when you didn't drive. Maybe the wheel wasn't even invented. God is walking upon the earth, and it's gotten very late. And suddenly, there appear two homes, one very large and one more comfortable, a little smaller. God says, well, if this home belongs to someone who is wealthy, surely I would not be a burden to the people who live there. So God goes and knocks on the door, and the man of the house answers, the rich man looks at him and says in his mind, oh, another traveler. Oh, another beggar. And God says, would you have room in your home for one weary person tonight? And just like us, by the way, the rich man says, oh, I'm so sorry. All my extra rooms are full of paintings and furniture that are very expensive, and I'm just waiting for the right time to sell them so that they'll bring a good price. And no matter, if I said yes to every beggar who knocked on my door, I would never have 
a moment of peace. Slams the door. God begins to go across the road to the more humble house, the smaller house. And even before knocking on the door, the man of the house is there saying, please, please, you are tired, you are weary, you've been traveling all day, come and stay at our house. Come, let us feed you a meal. The wife even seemed so pleased. She started cooking vegetables and the meal was delicious. They only had one room, they only had one bed, but they insisted that this unknown stranger to them should take the bed. The next morning, after a comfortable night's sleep, God gets up to find that the woman has already been out milking the cows, getting the eggs, fixing a hot breakfast. They are so cheerful and joyful that when the stay is over, God says, I want to say thank you so much for your hospitality. I want to say thank you so much for the care you've shown to me. You didn't know it, but I am able to grant three wishes. Anything that you would want, I want to give to you. And the man says, I can't believe that. We really don't need anything. We have everything that we need. Of course, we would wish... for salvation, for everlasting life. Beyond that, we would just wish for enough to eat and good health for both of us. God interrupts and says, well, that's just one wish. You have one more. The man and the wife confer, and they really can't come up with anything else. That's all they can think of. And so they say, that's it. Thank you so much, but that's, that's all we can even think to wish for. And God says, well, you know, how about just a, a little bigger house, a little nicer home? And before the man could speak, the woman says, oh, that would be good. <laughs> and before she finished speaking, their old house was gone and a new one was put in its place. God begins a new day's journey. The man across the street, the rich man, the man who had said no, wakes up, stretches, looks out his window and sees this house that didn't belong there, this house that wasn't there the night before. He runs out of his house in his bedclothes, knocks on the door, and he gets the story. And he says to himself, oh, if I'd have just known it was God. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like us too? If I'd have just known, then those wishes could have been mine. His wife says, it's not too late. Get on the horse. Go and find God. Get those wishes. So the man speeds on the horse and catches up to the, the weary traveler from the night before, the one who was once unknown but is now not so unknown. I'm so sorry. There must have been a miscommunication. I went back into my house to start trying to find covers and bedding, and when I came back to the door, you were gone. And God says, that's okay. The neighbor across the street took good care of me. And the man says, well, my wife and I, you know, anytime you're in the area, our house is open to you. Anytime now. And God says, the next time I come, I'll stay with you and your wife. And then the man says, how about those wishes? Will those be mine? And God says, all right, I'll grant you the three wishes. I don't even have to stay at your house. I'll grant you the three wishes, but I really think it'd be better if you didn't use them. And the man assured God, oh, I'll, I'll take care just take care to make sure that I get good things for my wife and I. And God says, be on your way. The wishes are yours. On the way home, the man is thinking about how he can use these wishes to his best benefit, what he can get from these wishes, and the horse starts to stumble. And the man is so disturbed by the horse that he says, oh, I just wish you'd break your neck and die. 
upon which he found himself standing on the ground with a saddle between his feet. Wish number one gone. He didn't want to leave the money of the saddle on the ground, so he put it on his back and he starts making his way to his house and it's so hot and the, the trail is so long and he starts thinking of his wife being at home in the cool air of their home and he starts to get so angry and so angry and the saddle is so heavy and, and he just says, I wish that my wife had to sit on this saddle and she couldn't even get up out of it. Poof. The saddle is gone. Realizing that he had just used his second wish, he's not very happy with himself. And he continues on the road, and it's still as hot as it ever was, and it still seems so difficult, as difficult as it was walking the trail with the saddle on his shoulders. He gets to home, and he sees his wife, and of course she's sitting on the saddle, but in his anger and his disgust, he's kind of forgotten the last half of that wish. And he looks at her and he says, I'm tired, I'm hot, and I'm hungry. Fix me a meal. And she's like in tears saying, I can't get off of the saddle. And he tries for an hour to pry her off that saddle. And it becomes evident that he's going to have to use the third wish. The rich man went through all this struggle and all he has to show for it at the end of the day is a scolding, sore feet and sore muscles. While across the street, the poor man and his wife live devoutly in faith until the end of their days. If we could just be urged to rise up with good attitudes if we could just be urged to rise up in faith and serve people when they come to our doorstep. We live in a different day. We can't just open the door and have people walk in and stay the night. That would be silly. That would be dangerous. But you get the idea, right? That somewhere along the way, we've got to be about something more than sitting in comfortable seats and saying comfortable things. We've got to be urged to rise up and be like the one who is the center of our faith, to be true disciples of Christ. For on Friday, we remember that Jesus was risen on a cross. And here on Sunday, we remember that the tomb is empty, and we believe, we believe a new life found because of an empty tomb. Rising is taking place today, my friends. Rising is taking place. And we're called to be a part of it. My dad loves game shows. Family Feud is his favorite. Right, Pops? Yep. If we were to have a game show about things that rise, what would be the answer? What would the survey say? Bread. Bread rises. Cinnamon bread grills. Pancakes rise on a griddle. For those of us who are at breakfast, we know these things to be true. Hot air balloons rise. Today the one who is the center of our faith, rises. Now, those first believers had no idea what was coming their way. Friday was grief-stricken. Friday was horrible. The one who was supposed to come and be the Messiah, the one who was supposed to come and raise an army, the one who was supposed to take the Israelites out of captivity, in a sense, under Roman rule, and bring them back to restored relationship with God, to bring them back to the covenant that they had had with God, that God says to them, I will be your God and you will be my people. They were supposed to live back into that under Jesus' leadership. And things happen in a different way. 
things happen in very unexpected ways. And the man who was supposed to lead them is now gone. And his best friends are hidden. They're nowhere to be found. They don't even go to the tomb, at least in the Gospel of Mark, right? They don't even go to the tomb. Who goes to the tomb? Women. Women go to the tomb. There are a few things that are consistent in the resurrection stories, in the empty tomb stories of the Gospels. There are some things that are consistent. There are some things that are not, by the way. In the Gospel of Mark, does Peter or any of the disciples come to the tomb? We just read it. Not one. It's just women. It's just women. Um, In the Gospel of Matthew, these same women go to the tomb. And then Peter comes along in the Gospel of Luke. Peter comes to see also in the Gospel of John. Mary is all by herself. It's not a bunch of women. It's just Mary all by herself. And eventually Peter and another unknown disciple come to the tomb. In some stories, the women tell the Easter story. In other stories, they don't. Why the inconsistencies? I don't know. Why is it that we don't have the same story told in each gospel? We'll never know. But there are certain things that are known. There are certain things that are consistent. Women go to the tomb. Sometimes they tell and sometimes they don't. Sometimes Peter is there and sometimes he isn't. But the tomb is always empty. And the story eventually always gets told. In the Gospel of Mark, if we'd have read a little further from where we just were, we would see that there are two endings in the Gospel of Mark. There's a shorter ending that is assumed to the original ending, where the women go back and they see some friends of Peter and quietly they tell the story. And then Jesus reveals himself. But it's all in a few amount of verses. It's not like the Gospel of John where it's strewn out. It's not like the Gospel of Matthew where we get a longer story. It's just quick. Now, if we go to the longer version of the story, we get Mary going and talking to Peter, and some things happen that are a little bit more like actually each of all the other three Gospels. This is why they think that that second ending has been added, because it takes a little of Matthew, a little of Luke, and a little of John. But the story eventually gets told. So today you hear the story. Today you come and you encounter the story. You experience the story. You come to know that the tomb is empty and you hear the try of the traditional Christian. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. And I ask you, how do you participate in the story? How do you help the rising? Because I believe that Jesus' rising isn't just about what happens to him. It's not just about to what happens to us when we die, although we put eternal hope into that story. I believe part of what we're supposed to find is a little heaven on earth, a little understanding of an uprising in our soul right now, that we're supposed to be about something faithful. It's not enough to hear the story. Once you hear the story, once you know the story, you have to rise up and share the story. Sometimes it's because you need to be lifted up in what's going on in your life in the moment. Sometimes it's because God has called you to lift someone else up. Famed professor and teacher, and preacher of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, Fred Craddock, who's recently passed away, tells the story of a time when he and his wife had left Oklahoma where they were working and decided to go into the Great Smoky Mountains for vacation. His wife, Nettie, and Fred, they were in a diner, something named with a bear, And while they were sitting there enjoying their first night of vacation, trying to unwind and relax, a man just walks up and says, well, good evening. And Fred 
startled, says, well, good evening. You guys on vacation? Under his breath, Fred mutters to himself, what business is that of yours? But outwardly, he says, yes. Where are you from? Oklahoma. Well, what do you do there in Oklahoma? This is an aside. You know what ministers, what questions they almost always don't want to answer on vacation? That one. (laughs) What do you do there in Oklahoma? Under his breath. (laughs) Fred's like, I don't know you, you don't know me, and I shouldn't have to answer this question. But outwardly, he says, I'm a Christian minister. And the man says, I kind of owe my life to a minister in the Christian faith. Let me tell you about that. He pulled up a chair and Fred said, yes, please sit right down. (laughs) You get the idea of how he meant that. The man says, back in the day that I was born, I was born without a dad. My mom took a lot of ridiculing for that. People treated her poorly. When I went to school, the other school children treated me like the adults treated my mom. They didn't want to have anything to do with me, so I stayed by myself at recess. I ate in the corner of the cafeteria for class, for, for lunch. I just didn't have any friends. I didn't do anything with those kids because they treated me so bad. When my mom and I would come to town, I would, I would see people just staring at us, looking her up and down, but they started staring at me, and they would, inside their minds, They were trying to figure out who my pa was. I knew it every time. Every time we went to town, they were trying to figure it out. One day when I was a little older, I decided that I would go to church. I ended up at this this one church, Laurel Springs Christian Church, in the mountains outside of town. I don't know why I went there. I just felt better when I went. But I didn't want to have any encounters with anyone. So I always went late, just in time for the sermon, and then I'd sneak out right after. That minister, he was, he, was, he was an attractive minister, but scary. Tall, broad-shouldered, beard, booming voice. But I felt comfort by going to hear him preach. One day I must have gotten caught up in everything that was going on. And so when the sermon ended, I was still in the pew. And people ended up getting into the aisle before I could get out and sneak out. And so I was stuck. I was standing there waiting to take my turn so I could leave the church when I felt this hand on my shoulder. A strong hand, firm grip on my shoulder. I knew exactly who it was the minute I felt his touch. I turned and looked, and I was a little scared. It was the minister, and I knew what was going to happen next. I knew he was going to try to figure out whose boy I was. I knew he was going to try to tell me what family I should be in. Boy, you're the son of... I knew that he was going to make me feel bad. I knew I was never going to be able to come to that church again. That minister stood there and spoke to me. He said, boy, you are a son of God. I see the resemblance clearly. gave him a tap on his back and said, go and claim your inheritance. This man standing at Fred Craddock's table sharing this story says, my life changed from that moment on. In fact, that was the moment when I really started to live. A Christian minister taken by the story says, What's your name? And the man said, my name is Ben Hooper. 
and Fred, who had been raised in the state of Tennessee, sitting there in the Great Smoky Mountain in the great state of Tennessee, remembered that his dad used to complain about a man that the people had elected to two terms as governor named Ben Hooper. A Christian minister gets up out of the pulpit and goes into the pew and says to his son, you are a child of the living God. Go and claim your inheritance. Don't worry about what everybody else is saying about you. Don't worry about the fact that you don't have an earthly father. You have a divine parent who will take care of you always. You are never alone. Go and claim your inheritance. The only thing that would make that story better is if it had happened on Easter. Because then this Ben Hooper that many of us don't know and didn't vote for, he would have known resurrection in a way that all of us are called to know. A small resurrection in our lives that moves us into faith, into the world to do good and great and faithful things. One last story. Tony Campolo talks about having a conversation with a man who grew up in Australia. And he tells the story of his seventh grade teacher. You see this man, when he had been a child, he had an older sister. And his older sister was wheelchair bound. Was wheelchair bound. And it was his job every day to push her from his house to school. He would meet her in her classes and take her from classroom to classroom. It was his job. And in fourth grade, his sister passed away, and his job was taken away from him. His identity was taken away from him. Quickly after that, he fell into sadness and hard times and began to be a troublemaker. And all of his teachers agreed, oh, he's a troublemaker. Started going into his record. For three years, it went into his record. Oh, he's a troublemaker. Seventh grade, a brand new teacher came to school. And this brand new teacher looked at the charts, looked at the files of all of his students. Mr. Smith, first day of class, he says, Billy, come to the front. I want you to sit right here. And Billy's thinking to himself, I don't think I've really done anything wrong today. Why am I being picked on on the first day of school? And then he just figures that his reputation has preceded him. So he comes and he sits down on the front row and the teacher says, Billy, and he picked up his file and he said, this file tells me everything about you and everything that you've done at school. Billy was a little bit ashamed. Started to put his head down. The teacher said, look at me, Billy. And he took that file and he ripped it apart and he said, I don't believe a word of it. Resurrection? In the here and now? You feel unworthy sometimes? God doesn't believe a word of it. You feel unlovable sometimes? God loves you anyway. You need to feel a little hope in your life. Turn to the empty tomb. Find the new life that is supposed to be yours. Now and forevermore, my friends, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Do you want to join me? Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Believe it. And live it. For those moments when you need it for yourself or those moments when you're called to help someone else find the new life in Christ. On this Easter day and every day, may it be so.
Amen. Please be seated as we gather around this table on this glorious Easter Sunday. The newness of life that we seek is always found here at the table, for it is here that we are met by the one who invites us, the one who invites all to come to this table. No one is turned away from here. So as this disciple celebrated on that Thursday night, we come on this Easter morning to share the same celebration, to hear those words again. So come with some expectancy. Come with some lightness of heart. Come and find your hope at this table. Shall we pray? Living God, long ago, faithful women proclaimed the good news of Jesus' resurrection, and the world was changed forever. On this great day of celebration, we pray that wherever there is poverty, sickness, selfishness, and war, the new creation of Jesus Christ may appear in justice, love, and peace. Through this holy meal given just three days ago, we have been eternally renewed by the bread of your Son. Teach us to keep faith so that our witness may be as bold, our love as deep, and our faith as true. Amen. Almighty and steadfast Lord, we thank you for the fruit of the vine, given so that we may remember Christ at Calvary. Welcome this day, knowing of our many sins. We come this day knowing of our many sins and shortcomings. Help us to lose ourselves in Christ, where in his blood we have our redemption. In his body, the church, we have our life. As we go forth from this sacred moment, may we be renewed in spirit and committed to him completely. Bless us, Lord, we pray. Amen. In just a moment, we will share in the act of communion. Our four pastor's class participants will come to the table. I'll meet them. They will share communion first, and then the rest of us will share their faith mentors will join them at the table and they will share to together communion for the first time as members of First Christian Church. We rejoice and celebrate in that. We rejoice and celebrate that all of us can come to the table this day, remembering that when Jesus sat at the table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. 
After the meal, he took wine and he blessed it and he poured it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my blood shed for forgiveness for many. Each time you eat of this bread and you drink from this cup, remember me. So it is that we come to the table to remember our Christ, the one who has risen, the one who has risen up to provide hope for us. May we find hope and love and peace and joy when we come to the table on this Easter. Let us share this holy communion.
Turn me up. There we go. A few weeks ago when uh, Judy Graves emailed me with my assignment to do Minute for Mission, I took a look at it and I went, oh no, I follow Mary Stepanowicz. <laughs> and, and it's on Easter too. I said, oh, this is not good. So in an effort to get out of it, <clears throat> I started looking online and I found this guy who did a, a really great job of explaining the, minute, the mission for the Easter offering this year. So for a couple of minutes, I wish you'd listen to this guy talk, and then I won't have to say anything else. <laughs> After the video's o over, the deacons will wait on you for your tithes and offerings and your gifts. Have you ever wondered how you might give clean water to a person living in a refugee camp? Have you ever wondered how you might support a person exploring God's call to vocational ministry? Have you thought about helping an immigrant who is here seeking a better life for their family? Do you want to help wider church ministries save money on administration, allowing for funds to be redirected to mission? Do you like new and innovative projects that seek to address food insecurity? Would you like to make the difference in the life of a child who might otherwise be sold into the sex trade or to a sweatshop because their family cannot afford to raise them? Have you subscribed to Disciples News Service and want to support the ministry that assembles and disseminates church-wide information? Well, today you can. You can give to the Easter offering, knowing that Global Ministry supports clean water and so many more life-giving projects around the globe. You can give knowing that higher education and leadership ministries is developing leaders for the future of the church. You can give to the Easter offering and support the Council on Christian Unity's work for the oneness of God's family. You can give and support Treasury Services, whose partnership with Regions is saving thousands of dollars per year, money that goes back into mission. You can make a gift to the Easter offering to help resettle refugees and support the National Benevolent Association's Incubate Program that is nurturing congregations as they develop health and human service type ministries. You can make a difference because you can make a gift to the 2015 Easter offering. You can make a gift supporting the general and racial ethnic ministries of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. I hope you will join me with your generous support.
Let us pray. Heavenly God, we thank you for the many blessings and gifts you bestow upon us. Please accept our offering today as we are reminded that our faith is intimately connected to your amazing, unwavering, and unconditional love for us and all your children. Lord, we are reminded of the brutal, brutal realities being knowingly, willingly, and obediently committed against Christians in our world. We pray for their courage, and we pray for our tension between thinking that there might be something we can do and our fear that we can do nothing. May you hold these people in the palm of your hand. We pray in the name of him who suffered for our sake, Jesus Christ. Amen. We come to that point in the service where we are invited to discipleship. We're invited to make some promises about how we will live as a response to the Easter story. We're invited to go and seek those many resurrections in our own lives. So we invite anyone who wants to become a member of First Christian Church on this Easter Sunday to come forward as we sing our closing hymn, number 224. But these promises to be made are for all of us. Let us make promises even as we sing. Please be seated. I'm going to go ahead and have you um, turn in your hymnals to page 341. We have some exciting stuff to share on this Easter Sunday. Many resurrections of people are coming to commit and recommit themselves to their faith. This is Randy Inman, and she is here on this Easter sun Sunday, and she has a son. Please remind me your son's name. Charvel. Charvel. And she comes to make a reconfession of faith that, um, and wants to become a member of this church. And so we celebrate that with you, Randy. In a minute, I'm going to ask you some questions, the same questions I'm going to ask these guys. This is Kristen Mahana. Kristen's been a member of our church since about a year and um, 40 days ago. Because yeah. <laughs> she, she came to us on Ash Wednesday for the very first time. She sings in our choir. She's a student at WIU. And nine years ago today, she was baptized at First Christian Church in Bloomington, Illinois. And so she would just like to come and rededicate her faith this day 
And then this one is my dad. And my dad comes to First Christian Church of Macomb by way of First Christian Church of Claremore, Oklahoma, where he has served long and faithfully. He is an elder emeritus, and he is happy. I'm speaking for him, but I know he's happy. <laughs> there may be tears coming out, but he's happy. Um, he, is, he has just recently joined the Macomb community and living at Grand Prairie and is coming forward to um, make his reconfession of faith and become a member of our church. We're not going to ask him not to be a member at First Christian Church in Claremore, Oklahoma, <laughs> where he serves so long and so well and is an elder emeritus. We're going to have dual memberships. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask anybody. I hope that's okay. <laughs> so I will ask all three of you, Randy, Kristen, and... He goes by Chuck. <laughs> Do you believe in God? Yes. Do you believe in God as revealed through Jesus the Christ? Yes. On behalf of First Christian Church, we rededicate and we welcome you into the life of this church. And we are so, so grateful to have you be a part of us. All right. I'm going to have you guys stay right here. Um, actually, if we can bring downstairs and he can sit, you guys could sit in the front row. I'm going to have you four come up to the steps with me. I'm going to ask our faith mentors to also come. Go right on up. Don't be shy. <laughs> Kristen, you can sit right here with Randy. In these bags, we have some information for our new members of the church. Now, we need to introduce one member of our pastor's class. This is Aaron Munir. Aaron, wave to everybody. Aaron has been baptized already, and so he comes today. He made his confession of faith last week, so we welcome you, Aaron, into the life of this church upon that confession we officially welcome you as a full member of First Christian Church. We're so proud of you, just as we are of all of you who have been a part of the pastor's class. They've studied well. They have um, spent time in conversation with the folks that you see behind them. Jack um, was um, Griffin's faith mentor. Chris was Aaron's. Anne was Brianna's. And Barb was Emily's. Um, in their bags, they have their certificates. They have a, t a pledge card. They have a cup that um, has our church logo. And then this gift, which is going around their necks this day, is a gift to you from our church. It is a shell. And back in the olden days, um, the desert fathers, when they were in the desert, they would use shells and they would find puddles of water because there would not be water close by. And they would use these shells and they would dump the water over the folks. And that's how some folks were baptized in days gone by. And so this day, we celebrate your baptism. And each time you see this shell, we hope it will, it will remind you of your baptism this day. Um, we are so proud of you and so happy to welcome you as full members of First Christian Church. Can we clap for these folks? I think we will do this for the um, folks who just came up today. We will stay here in the front, and if you want to come and um, shake hands and welcome, please do so. For families and for pastors, class folks, and for faith mentors, whom I wish for you to say thank you to um, when you pass them in the hall today and for the next few weeks, because they did a great job of having a conversation about their faiths with these young people, and it was a lot of fun. I hope you guys had fun doing it. It was a lot of fun. We'll have you go to the parlor. And I've seen cake and rolls and everything else still sitting out. So if you're, you can still get some food. <laughs> you should have your hymnal to 341. Let us welcome all of these folks. Why don't we have Dad come right here and Randy and Kristen come right back up and we can welcome everybody. Let's read together. Reaffirming our own faith in Jesus the Christ, we gladly welcome you into this community of faith. 
enfolding you with our love and committing ourselves to your care. In the power of God's Spirit, let us mutually encourage each other to trust God and strengthen one another to serve others, that Christ's church may in all things stand faithful. It's been a busy day. Let's stand for the benediction. But a beautiful day, right? Busy but beautiful. Let's just do it one more time. Christ is risen. Go forth and live that promise. Know that promise today and forever. This is our Easter hope in the name of the risen Christ. Amen.